Australia's radar defences were compromised overnight during multinational war games in the Northern Territory. It's a picture that was obtained from, uh, not obtained, it was on board a Chinese warship that was in uh, Sydney Harbor uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, this was on the bulkhead and somebody had an open ship tour and somebody walked on the ship and took a picture of it and we got a copy of it. Um, it's not classified or anything. Uh, but what you see there is a dragon. I'm not sure if you can see this dragon right here. That's the head of a dragon and then there's arrows going out into the Philippine Sea, into the South China Sea, and up into the Sea of Japan. I've some assistance from a couple of my associates that translated some of those uh, yellow uh, call-out boxes, and you can see where the straits are. And for the folks here from Japan that live in the theater, you know, Miyaku Strait become very important strait over time, but even more so, it seems like, in the last uh, few weeks. Again, I, I want to reiterate uh, the views that I'm giving you largely are from the Chinese perspective. This wasn't put together by US, this wasn't put together by Australians or anybody else. This was what was on a Chinese warship, what Chinese sailors of the People's Liberation Army Navy see on board their ship as they're sailing around the Pacific. Okay? That says something to me. Hopefully it'll say something to you. If you go back and you look at the Chinese military modernization program, I go take it back to 2000 as a frame of reference, in 2000, the Chinese Navy and the Chinese military were inwardly focused. They operated as a Navy not more than 40 or 30 or 40 miles off the coast. Sometimes they would send a ship to Hawaii, a single one or two ships, but their day-to-day -day operations were inside the first island chain. And their order of battle was relatively small compared to the U.S. 7th Fleet. Fast forward 15 years to this time frame that we're talking about now, and not only have they acquired massive amounts of materials in military hardware, but they've extended their operations from the coastal region out, not only into the first island chain, but well out into the, into the uh, Philippine Sea on a routine basis. And you can see the spending, I mean, obviously they've had dramatic spending increases over the last 30 years. And if you project forward just a couple of years, Chinese naval operations, and we're already seeing it, are now becoming more routine into the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal and up into the European theater. And the, pro the progress in terms of purchasing power that they have, even with their cooling off of their economy, we haven't seen the commensurate cooling off of procurement of military systems. So the economy's declined a bit, and yes, they tell us that they're having to pay a lot of their uh, defense spending on increased budgets for personnel, but they're drawing their personnel down, and I'll talk about that in a second. But what we see is, and I I'll be, have to be careful here because I, I don't have it, the figure right in front of me, but uh, I did an analysis of all the Chinese announcements here in the last year. They announced how many ships they built in the last three years, two and a half to three years. Uh, just warships, not uh, submarines, but just warships that, that they published and compared it to U.S. commissioned warships and it was on the, about the order of four to one. The China produced four times as many warships in the last three and a half or three, two and a half to three years as the United States. And there's debate about whether that trend will continue. This red line that I've put down here, uh, oops, this red line that I've put down here, I've put it as solid because my assessment is, is that it's gonna continue to grow. Uh, some will debate that and say, no, it may level off. Uh, but the question for the United States and, and the region is, is are we going to increase our, our presence and our capabilities out here, or are we going to stay flatlined like we basically have been for the last 15 years?
Ten years ago, people told me China has no core interest in the South China Sea. Okay? Is that still true? And then this is also another CSIS graphic that just shows if you put some of the you know, surface-to-air missile sites and defensive sites and radar ranges, where this would kind of give this uh, overlapping coverage uh, and this ability to not only see what's down in the South China Sea, but to be able to take and engage some, some platforms. I just added this graphic. Uh, this is thanks to the uh, China Maritime Studies Institute up at the Navy War College. Professor Lyle Goldstein uh, was researching in a magazine called the uh, Naval and Merchant Ships Magazine, which is produced by the China State, Shipbuild China State Shipbuilding Corporation, CSSC, one of their two major shipbuilding organizations. And this is from a magazine this year. And what you see up here in the top right is the South China Sea and you see these three airfields represented here and the overlapping coverage that they have from the HQ-9 surface-to-air missile system, which is a couple hundred, uh, um, uh, 200 kilometer range. Then you have the YJ-62, which is 300 uh, kilometer range surface-to-surface -surface missile that's fired from shore batteries. And then you have JH J-11 and JH-7s pictured here with 1,500 nautical mile radius. And so this is just, again, Chinese State Shipboard Corporation's envisionment of how these new islands will be used and how they will be able to provide you know, military capability down here in the South China Sea. And it's not just defensive. Down in the bottom half of the picture, you can see the YJ-62 and you can see Chinese frigates firing missiles at an aircraft carrier that's burning them on fire. Yeah, if you can't see that right there, that's an aircraft carrier that's been attacked from overlapping, mutually supporting fires from different islands and different platforms. What you would consider to be modern warfare in today's day and age. Again, from China, China State Shipbuilding Corporation. Not from the Pentagon, not from any think tank, from the Chinese. And then, all of this gets into this idea of being able to conduct an amphibious invasion. And so this is a picture from April up in the Paracels where Chinese vessels are practicing amphibious warfare operations, albeit on a small scale, but nonetheless practicing this. Now moving kind of more back into the intentions and what China's stated military aspirations are, Two documents that you should be aware of and things that you should look at in the unclassified realm is the Science of Campaigns that was published in 2006 and then several iterations of the Science of Military Strategy that go back into the 1980s uh, and the latest one, 2013. These documents talk about China's, not their aspirations for rejuvenation and restoration, but how they will fight campaigns to get what they need and to restore, the, restore territory that they want, for instance, like Taiwan. And so these documents are important to understand and analyze, and they give us a glimpse into what China's designs are for this short, sharp war here in the East China Sea. Okay. Principally, these documents were written, as I said, more towards Taiwan, but when you think about the challenge that the PLA was given by their leadership, to be able to have the capability to conduct an amphibious invasion or an invasion of Taiwan, we think by the 2020 timeframe is what they were given originally by Hu Jintao and probably now by Xi Jinping, that things like the Senkakus or things like the Spratly Islands or Scarborough are lesser included into this larger Taiwan strategy that had been working for several years. So while you're decades. Again, your goal is to restore yourself, get your territory, take the Senkakus, take the Spratleys. You want to do it through peaceful means, I believe. The Chinese, I, it's, I'm glad I make sure I say this, I sometimes forget. I believe that China never wants to fire a shot. I believe they want to restore themselves without having to use physical force. You have to just read Sun Tzu and you have to follow what they're doing, like at Scarborough in 2012, where they acquired Scarborough Reef without or shoal without firing a, a shot. So I think that's what they really want to do, uh, but they know that they may not get that from every 
place that they want to restore. This is from Rand's uh, corporation, the scorecard study, if any of you have seen that study. This is a 20 year look at uh, the missile forces of China on the coast in the East China Sea area from 1996 until this, this coming year. And what you see as short range ballistic missiles they had 20 years ago about to in, in the numbers of tens of these short range ballistic missiles. Fast forward 20 years and you're talking thousands of these short to medium range ballistic missiles and hundreds of these longer range, uh, uh, longer range missiles, okay? Just in 20 years. Another way to look at this, this is from the, uh, the US-China Economic Security Review Commission. And what you see arrayed across uh, this graphic, it may be hard to read, but I'll just gist it out to you. There's 16 different missile types represented here that cover air launch missiles, naval launch missiles, and ground launch missiles with varying ranges from, you know, a couple hundred kilometers out to, you know, two, three thousand, four thousand kilometers. All designed to provide a defender with a complex problem because you're getting missiles coming in at cruise missile elevation, ballistic missiles coming in, maneuvering missiles coming in, shot from aircraft, shot from submarines, shot from ground launch uh, silos. So if you're trying to defend against that, if you're Japan, the United States, or somebody down in the South China Sea, it becomes a very complex and difficult problem. And these are just some of the weapon systems and the families of weapons. I'm gonna quickly go through these. Containerized weapons systems that make it modular and easier to use and have across different shipboard types of the YJ-83 series. Missiles launched, again, China does a lot of live fire missile testing compared to other other militaries in the region. In fact, I would say they probably do more live fire testing than anybody in the Pacific, which, you know, there's debate about that in Washington, D.C. because it costs money to fire live fire munitions. Uh, and so you can do a lot through computers and simulation. But there is, if you talk to anybody who's an operator, there's nothing like actually firing a live fire missile and going through that whole process from, you know, beginning to end. This is another live fire from a Type 22 Hobey. Again, small patrol craft that you wouldn't necessarily think would be used, but it, it, it goes from big combatants down to the smallest combatants, from submarines to bombers to fighters to CJ-10s or DH-10s, now called CJ-10s, or fighter bombers. Again, YJ-62. And then finally, uh, here on November 28th, you probably saw in the press that China conducted what they said was a salvo test of the DF-21 Charlie. You may have heard of the Dongfeng-21 Delta, which is called the anti-carrier ballistic missile, which the U.S. Navy has been obviously very concerned about for, for quite a while. Um, spent, a lot of, spent a lot of time on that missile. The DF-21C is essentially the same thing as a DF-21D except it's designed to go after land targets. And so China here on the 28th, just less than a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, told us, publicized the firing and had video on television, their television, showing 10 of them being launched at once. Okay, so remember I showed you those documents from 2006 and 2013, those doctrinal publications, and they talked about the joint fire strike and some people look at me and say, okay, yeah, whatever, that's 10 years old. That's not really what they're thinking. Okay? They write the doctrine, they scrutinize the doctrine, they build force structure to the doctrine, and then they train to the doctrine. So don't tell me that the doctrine's not designed to be used when the decision's been made to, to execute. DF-26, this is an, uh, just essentially a DF-21D doubled the range. So now it can hit Guam. So instead of eight to 900 miles, it's going out to 1,500 miles. Air defense coverage, just so we're on short on time here, the coverage has expanded over 20 years and it goes well out past and into the first island chain. And then you extend that coverage with advanced surface uh, uh, vessels like the Luyang-2 destroyer that has the Dragon Eye phased array radar that extends the air defense coverage where these aircraft or where these ships go. And the numbers of missiles that their ships are having that can shoot down aircraft continues to increase. 
This picture is just to say that it's not just, we talk a lot about joint operations on the US side, the Chinese are training the joint operations. That's a picture of a, a JH-7 operating over a Chinese warship. And the point is, and it was in a Lin, Linhai uh, EC exercise, and the point here is to suggest that flying jet aircraft over combat warships that have surface-to-air missiles is not just something you just do because you can get shot down. And so you have to have explicit understanding of missile engagement zones and fire engagement zones and command and control. And the Chinese are trained. Mostly I've been talking about subsonic and supersonic missiles, uh, but now we've seen over the last two years seven tests of the Wu-14, uh, which is a hypersonic glide vehicle that goes from five to 10 Mach, five to 10 times the speed of sound, which adds in another new dimension into your requirements to defend against Chinese military operations. So if you remember that RAND slide with all those missiles coming from those different platforms, and then you add this in, it just compounds the problem that a defender has. And now China's talking about a new, creating a new bomber. So the H6K is, like I said, 70s kind of technology in a way. Uh, they're now talking about publicly they're going to build a stealth bomber. If you were talking about a short, sharp war over the Nansei Shoto, um, one of the ways that people, I think, and maybe in the civilian world think is, well, it's just going to come from, you know, the Shanghai area and it's going to go straight at the Nansei Shoto, right? Well, it's going to be more than that. Look at the doctrine. Look at what they're training to. They've already proven that they can fly from the South China Sea through the Bashi Channel and come in this way. So they're going to be able to provide another threat vector from the rear, if you will, plus the massive attack from the front. And then there are probably going to be attacks on the main islands here. So you have to consider that when China says it's time to pull the trigger, they're not just going to do it halfway. They didn't build all this. They didn't build this military capability because they didn't have the intention to restore China to its greater self in their vision. So this is my last slide. Um, as an intelligence officer, you always have to talk about the future. If you're just talking about the past, then you're, no offense here, but you're just a newspaper reporter. So my profession was always designed to, so what does this mean? What have I told you? What does it lead to? And what I think it leads to is, is that China is on a pathway. Their President Xi Jinping said, we're not going to wait forever on Taiwan. We're not going to wait forever to restore ourselves. They have a timeline. And I believe the timeline is 2049. Now, Mr. Mike Pillsbury wrote a book called The 100-Year Marathon. This slide predates his book by two or three years. I've been talking about this for at least five years. And I believe 2049, based on what the Chinese say, is the 100, it's not, that's a fact, it's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. And I believe China wants to have, the, uh, wants to be restored by 2049. That means they want to have, under their control, and it could be like Hong Kong, could be something akin to that, but they want to have sovereignty over everything that they believe is theirs. And so in order to do that, remember I said, I believe they want to use economic means, information and diplomacy predominantly to get what they want. But if everyone doesn't capitulate through those pressures and they're not going to give in, at some point, somebody's gonna say, well, we're going to have to use military force to get this stuff before we have our big celebration in 2049. And so the question is, when can I use military force? When can they use military force and still expect the world to essentially accept their restoration in 2049? And I think they have an example. And the example is 1989 to 2008, basically a 20-year time frame. In 1989, the world watched as China rolled over its people in Tiananmen Square and killed thousands of Chinese citizens. And the world, rightly so, said, this is not a good thing. And we don't accept this kind of behavior. And China was ostracized for that. Then fast forward to August 8, 2008, in Beijing, in the bird's nest of the opening day opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. Anybody watch that? Okay, I, I watched it. I remember it vividly. That beautiful bird's nest stadium 
with those drummers beating the drums. And up in the box, they had the air-conditioned box at the top of the stadium. And in the air-conditioned box were nine men. At that time, the, people's, uh, the standing committee of the Politburo was nine people. President Hu Jintao was standing there on camera in his Mao suit, and he was cool, and he was calm, and he was collected. And then as the cameras from the different news organizations panned around the stadium, you saw different various world leaders. And I saw one world leader, who was the President of the United States. And under, he had no jacket on, because it was 95 degrees, and it was 95% humidity. He had big, huge sweat stains under his arms. Okay? And there were other leaders of the world there. And so I think what the Chinese leader saw is in a space of 19 to 20 years, they went from telling us we were barbarians to coming and kissing the ring so they could watch the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So if you take that 20 year time frame and you back it up from 2049, you have about 2030, okay? And then if I told you, as I think I mentioned earlier, that the PLA has been given an order to be able to have the military capability to conduct invasions to, to get what is theirs. Not that they will, but to have the capability by 2020. This is what I call the decade of concern. Because as we go from today, even today, up through this time frame, if China can't get what they want, there's going to be voices in China that are going to argue, we got to pull the trigger. We got to pull the trigger. Because if you pull the trigger after 2030, it's likely the world may still condemn you and your celebration will be tainted and invalidated. Robert, if I came up to you right now and I hit you in the nose, and then I finished my talk, and after the talk I said, hey, well, you want to go out for dinner? You'd probably tell me to do something. <laughs> to, pay for, to pay for the dinner. Right. <laughs> but if I hit you today, and then I come back in five years, and I say, hey, you want to go to dinner? And in between, we have some statements and make some ramifications and explanations. You may consider having dinner with me in five years. Maybe not. Maybe you're a hardcore guy. <laughs> but my point is, the Chinese probably figure if they use physical force in 2030 or later, the world may not r respect them. So they're going to be pressured to use military force in that decade is my thesis. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but so far, the last 15 years, it seems like everything's been ticking off as we kind of saw it. China is developing some pretty significant capabilities that are advanced technologies. And I think they're going to play into this joint anti-air raid campaign. And these kind of capabilities have to be considered. And it's not just what they're acquiring, it's what they're doing with their aircraft. You can see back in September, uh, there was the flight that went out from the uh, East China Sea out in through the Miyaku Strait into the Philippine Sea where you had uh, an H-6 bomber escorted by an Su-30 flanker. Uh, and that's not unprecedented, but it was the first time that we'd seen flankers come out that far, uh, this variant of the flanker come out that far into the East China Sea. No small feat. I mean, we talk about the United States and the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force operating fighters and flying in this water but we're flying from Okinawa, okay? Our combat radiuses and the operations are, are, are enhanced because we're already out in the middle of the ocean. But when you have to fly all the way from here, from bases that are 100 kilometers plus inland or just right on the coast and then fly all the way across the East China Sea, it shows and demonstrates a capability that the Chinese recently haven't had. And they're now putting this on display uh, much more often. This is the same flight. What you can see here is the CJ-10 land attack cruise missile, 1,500 nautical mile range cruise missile. Can attack land targets and ship targets. Not only, you know, to get these fighters out here, I guess I should have switched those pictures, but this gets the point across that they're doing complex military operations out over the Philippine Sea. This is not amateur hour, okay? And it's being controlled by a KJ-2000, so an airborne early warning and command uh, aircraft. So it wasn't just a fighter or a bomber, it was a package. 
It was the complete how you would go to war concept. So they're training as they will fight, so to speak. This was from November, another event. In this event, I think this is the event on the 25th of November that went and circ circ circumnavigated uh, Taiwan, uh, came out through the Bashi Channel in the South China Sea, went through the Bashi Channel and then up the East Coast north and then back through the Miyaku Strait and then landed in the East China Sea. We hadn't seen that before. So a number of unprecedented air operations uh, that we really haven't seen from the Chinese over the last several years, ever, they're unprecedented. We've seen the Navy kind of come out in the 07, 06 timeframe with submarines and surface ships routinely going out into the Philippine Sea one or two a year, and now it's just on a continual basis now 10 years later. What we're seeing now is the same, in my mind, the Air Force is doing the same thing that their naval counterparts did a decade ago. So I would expect to see naval or air operations like this from the Chinese to occur at least on a monthly basis, if not more, over the course of now. It will continue to be that way normally. And then this is just uh, from the 10th of December, it was put out. Um, this is another circumnavigation of Taiwan coming out of the East China Sea. And you can see the flight routes. This is passed by the Taiwan uh, uh, military. Um, in the press. Uh, so you can see the flight, flight path, but this is again another H-6K bomber, older generation bomber based on a Russian TU-16 design uh, frame, but the internals and the engines and everything else are, are upgraded and new. And with the CJ-10 land attack cruise missile, and this is the mountain in Taiwan. So they estimate that they are maybe 50 kilometers off of the coast.